and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to February 1984 for all the latest Sinclair news and Spectrum game releases, we compare missile command clones to find which is the best Spectrum version, we look at some older games, and review some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine in February 1984. Quicksilver has announced they're about to release several games for the Spectrum that will cater for a wide variety of tastes. The Snowman, based on the book by Raymond Briggs, heads up the releases, along with Laser Zone, Fred, and Dragon's Bane. A new system that could effectively stop pirating has been forced to be suspended and all research stopped. The system, that not only stops backup copies but also tape-to-tape -tape copies, seemed so good that the Ministry of Defence has stepped in. They've served a secrecy notice on JLC, the company involved, and all patents have been pulled. JLC has been ordered to send all related material to the MOD and never speak of it again. The system imprints a second signal underneath the main data, which is undetectable, but without it the program does not load. This signal cannot be reproduced by tape-to-tape -tape or backup copies. The Minister of Defence didn't want this technology to become public, scared that it could also be used to hide messages in telephone conversations or online data exchanges. Due to huge orders placed for Sinclair's new machine, it is expected that many people will now have to wait a bit longer for delivery. Initial orders should be arriving in the first batch, due for delivery on the 17th of February, but stock is not expected until later that month. The reason for the late shipping, according to Sinclair, is the continued work on the ULA chip. Sinclair have said they would not look at providing backward compatibility for the new QL machine, so it's been left to another company to take up the slack. Joe the Lion, strange name for a company, but there you go, has announced that they are working on a Spectrum emulator for the QL. It will consist of software supplied on microdrive, plus a hardware interface to allow cassette players to be connected. The price is expected to be around £25. And now onto the new games releases. We're still in the post-Christmas rush, and Attic Attack and Death Chase are still riding high on the charts. But the newcomers include Checkered Flag, a great racing game from Scion, Stonkers, a strategy game from Imagine, Hunchback, an arcade clone from Ocean, and The Pyramid, an arcade game from Fantasy Software. And that's the end of the news and new releases for February 1984. Missile Command was an intriguing game launched in 1980 by Atari and licensed to Sega for distribution in Europe. The cabinet was different to other arcade games though, due to the unique control system the game demanded. It didn't have a joystick like the others, instead it had a large trackball. This may at first seem odd, but once you play the game you soon realise it's a brilliant control system, and playing Missile Command without a trackball is just not the same. The game's simplistic graphics made it ideal for home conversion, and all early consoles and micros had at least one version of the game. The idea was simple, protect your cities from falling missiles with your own limited supply, located in three missile bases, left, right and centre. A crosshair on screen, moved by the trackball, sets the position for your missiles, and you can fire from either of the three bases. Later levels also include planes and satellites to hit, all intent on destroying your cities. An unofficial mod, released later called Super Missile Attack, added many changes to the game, including palette differences, which gave different levels different background colours. Some of the Spectrum clones took on this idea, some with success, others not so. Simple game, great concept, great gameplay, but which of the Spectrum clones can match up? First off is Aftermath from Alternative Software, released in 1988. Initial impressions of this game are good, the graphics have been updated and they look really nice, gameplay is smooth, but there are a few problems. Firstly, there's only one laser base in the middle of the screen. If that gets destroyed, that's more or less the end of the game, or at least that level. The explosions too are a bit small, meaning your accuracy has to be good. There's also no branching of the inbound missiles, and the sound is a bit minimal. Another problem is the random speed of the enemy missiles, which seems to have the upper limit set too high. 
Some just float down the screen, which is fine for the first couple of levels, but every now and again you'll get one that just blatter downwards way too fast and you haven't got a chance to react to it. This is the one that normally takes out your missile base as well. It's a pity really because the game is really nice, the graphics change for each level, and when it's working at arcade speeds it's fine. Fixing this problem and maybe adding a second missile base would make this game a potential winner, but as it is, it's just average. Next we have Armageddon from Ocean, released in 1983. This game has very minimalistic graphics, and like Aftermath, does not have three missile bases. On the plus side, it doesn't have missile bases at all, which focuses your main concern on defending the cities. The game plays really well, much better than Aftermath. It has smooth movement and nice explosions, the game speed's just about right, making it easy to progress, and the sound complements the action. I actually enjoyed playing this game, and it even mimics the arcade with branching inbound missiles, which really spices things up. So the speed of the game slowly increases, and everything seemed to be going great, until the colour scheme changed when you moved levels, presumably to mimic the unofficial mod mentioned earlier. Sadly though, the in inappropriate use of bright ruins it and turns the screen into a mass of bright and non-bright character squares, and there's no real need for this, and it does lower the game's overall score. It would have been far better to keep the background black, just like the original. However, gameplay is not too bad, but I certainly wouldn't put it up among those top ones. Next is another game called Armageddon, this time by Silversoft, released in 1983. So far, this is the only game brave enough to offer three missile bases for the player to control. This adds a lot more strategy to the gameplay as well, but has the obvious disadvantage of having three fire keys. The graphics are minimalistic but suited to the game, but the cursor moves in character-based jumps, making aiming a bit tricky. The difficulty is pitched a little bit too high, in my opinion. The game often starts with a frenzy of fire button pressing, rather than planning or strategic defence. The addition of aliens that drop down and destroy things is unnecessary, and just causes more frustration when all you're trying to do is manage your three missile bases and defend your cities. The sound is adequate and the explosions are sufficient, and they do last long enough to be useful. Again, this game opts for colour scheme changes, like the unofficial mod, which at times can be distracting, especially when you're trying to track inbound missiles on a yellow background. As the game progresses, things speed up as you would expect, although in this instance, with the attacking aliens, it becomes too much, and the screen inevitably fills with explosions as you just keep pressing the fire button. Not a bad game overall, but certainly not one of the best. Next we have Cruise Attack, from Microgen, released in 1983. It has some nice graphics and good sound, and two missile bases to control, which adds to the gameplay. The key layout is difficult to use though, which is a major flaw. P is left and L is right for example, the fire keys are Z and symbol shift, and all these combinations causes many misfires as you waste your time pressing fire instead of trying to move. The levels seem to be decided on how many missiles you destroy, so even after you have no cities left to defend, the missiles still keep falling until you have destroyed them all, and then you get the game over message. The difficulty is a little bit too high to start with, as a mass of inbound missiles all arrive at the same time. There's also no branching, but the addition of this would have raised the difficulty much too high. This is not a bad attempt, it's just a pity about the initial difficulty levels really. Next we have Earth Defence, released by Arctic Computing in 1984. It seemed that all the big players were given as missile command clones and Arctic were no exception. This game gives us three missile bases, but no additional controls to fire them, which in my opinion is a good balance of easy gameplay and offering the best resilience for longer playtime. The graphics are simple, which is pretty much to be expected for this game, they're smooth and responsive and the explosions are particularly nice, lasting the right amount of time to provide a fire and forget feeling, just like the arcade. The sound is good, having some nice effects and some lovely explosion sounds. This, like previous games, chooses to switch colour schemes as you progress, but unlike the others, for some reason, it isn't too distracting. Maybe it's because of the combinations used. The gameplay is excellent, and very close to the arcade machine. Not having to decide which base to fire from removes the awkward controls and leaves the player free to concentrate. Ideal for home micro -clones. The inbound missiles don't branch, but that doesn't matter in this game, as you get so much more. I got caught up in this, something that had not happened in the other games and I spent a good 30 minutes blasting my way through the levels, 
This is a real contender for top spot, and is the only one so far that gives you a proper arcade game feel. Next we have Missile Command from Cascade Games in 1984. What did I really expect from Cascade Games? A poorly written basic game with beeper sound, jerky graphics and awful gameplay. The firing is very hit and miss. The target missiles have often moved on before the fire key is actually registered. I think we should move on quickly. Next we have another game called Missile Command, this time from Precision Software, released in 1983. This is... terrible. The graphics are jerky, the sound is average, the control is awful. I think for everyone's sake we should best pretend we never saw this. Nothing to see here, move along. And a third game called Missile Command, this time from SeaTech, released in 1982. This has to be some kind of joke, right? I mean, I know the software industry was only just getting started in 1982, but to put out a 3.5k basic program and expect people to buy it? Really? This mess is headache inducing, the border continually changes, the controls are so unresponsive you think your keyboard's broken. The sound consists of the same single beep used for everything, and the missile trails are just laughable. Yet another early game consigned to the rubbish bin. Next we have Missile Defense, an Anirog software released in 1983. After some initial problems getting the controls to work with my emulator, this game really came to life. You can choose to use the keyboard, which will allow you to control the three bases independently, or use a joystick, which automatically uses the central one. This option I found the best, allowing me to concentrate on the game rather than worrying which base to use. The gameplay is good, surprisingly so for an early Anirob game. The graphics are nice, the sound is good, the implementation is just right, it's just a shame about the background colours changing yet again. The difficulty is just right, allowing you to progress, and if you can get over the colour schemes, I think you'll really enjoy this game. Next we have Missile Defense from Magnum Computing, released in 1986. This is a weird variation of the game, in which you have to drop mines instead of firing missiles. This may not have been a bad idea had the controls not been such a nightmare. The crosshair continues to move even after you stop pressing the key, so you end up with a virtually uncontrollable crosshair whizzing across the screen, randomly dropping mines everywhere. The sound is grating as well, and the graphics are below par, and each level seems to be over rather too quickly. The thing that let this game down overall though is the controls, so it's not a game I really recommend. Next we have Space Missile Command from Profisoft, released in 1984. A commercial game released in 1984, written in BASIC. Are you serious? As you can see, it's pretty terrible. This would have been a good game had it been a typing in a magazine, but to release it commercially is just madness. Being basic, it has all the usual drawbacks. Slow, jerky graphics, unresponsive controls and terrible sound. Keep clear of this one. Next is Repulsar from Softec, released in 1983. Here we get a single missile base and the usual cities to defend. At first the gameplay seems a bit pedestrian. Your missiles explode quicker than normal, making timing essential. But later levels the gameplay improves and things begin to get hectic. Planes and aliens soon appear, dropping more missiles from lower down the screen, and the number of inbound missiles increases. The graphics are smooth, the control is responsive and sound is used well. This is not a bad game but somehow it just doesn't get the heart pumping like some of the earlier ones. Worth trying though. And lastly we have War Game, written by Abex and released in 1984. Not as I was hoping, some kind of tie-in with the movie, but just another average clone. 
There are two missile bases to control, but the speed of the missiles is just laughable and makes the game unplayable. The graphics are okay and the sound is a bit noisy, and there are some nice effects, but the thing that lets it down is the actual speed of the missiles. The control is a bit confusing using strange keys to move the crosshair, but that could have been ignored had the gameplay been decent. As it is, this is just a letdown. The missiles move far too slowly and the game just doesn't stand up. Not the worst game tested, but certainly not one of the best. So, which of the Spectrum games is going to come out the winner? This may be a little controversial, but the decision is probably based on my own opinions and how I like the game to be. So, the winner of this arcade shootout, Earth Defense by Arctic Computing. It's the only one that really gives you the arcade feel, and certainly worth trying if you like that type of game. This is Glass, released by Quicksilver in 1985. The game is a 3D arcade shooter, seeing you as a newly recruited pilot, setting off to destroy three enemy cities. Before you can destroy them though, you have to navigate and blast your way past many of the defences. These include various types of robots and tanks, and huge motherships. The game looks really impressive, with a nice reflection effect and large smooth graphics. Between each level you get a nice 3D grid effect, which takes you on to the next level. Some levels mimic Death Chase, seeing you swerve past towers. This helps to break up the gameplay a little bit. Once you get used to controls, the game itself isn't too difficult, and after about 10 minutes you begin to lose interest, only carrying on to see what the next set of graphics will look like. Sound is used well and each level has a timer, so you know how long things will take. Your shields are important, lose them and the game is over. Luckily though, they get replenished every so often, allowing you to carry on. If you do lose all of your shields, you are still allowed to carry on with the mission, but you are not awarded a score or ranking. After battling through the first 20 or so levels, I was graciously awarded the level of Commodore User. Nice. I continued on though, just so that I could destroy the first city to see what the effect was like. The game isn't bad and the graphics are nice, but I wouldn't say it's one of the better games released by Quicksilver. Power Drift was released by Activision in 1989, and it was a very brave release pitting the Spectrum's limited power and graphics capabilities against the might of a full-blown 3D arcade machine. The arcade machine was extremely popular, providing not only track racing, but the added feature of log hills, making the game more challenging. It's obvious that the Spectrum can't mimic the graphic power of the real thing, and so the best Activision could do was use monochrome graphics. The game is fast-paced though, and it plays really well. Controls are responsive and the bug is handled nicely, sliding round corners without going overboard. Despite being monochrome, the graphics are not too distractive and you soon become accustomed to them. The road for me is a little too narrow, making overtaking tricky, at least more tricky than the arcade game. Despite that though, the game is great fun to play and not overly difficult. The feeling of speed is good and the perspective used is just right. The game scores highly in most areas like graphics, sound, playability. It's all good, especially on a 1 to 8K machine. The only thing that I didn't like was the music. This tended to play randomly depending on the level you were on, and could sometimes slow down if the screen was too busy. Having just the sound effects was far better, but I couldn't find a way just to have these on in instead of the music. If you like racing games, especially arcade races rather than simulations, then this will tick all the boxes. It's a really good game. Now we're going to look at something different for this section. Not a game, but a music demo. 
The main comment passed by Commodore users in the early days of the computer wars was that the Spectrum SAM capabilities were really poor. It wasn't until the 128K versions appeared that this issue was sorted out. But, given the right skills, you could produce some really excellent music on a standard 48K machine. To highlight this, download Battle of the Bits ZX Spectrum Beeper Speaker Combo 2010. Load this into your emulator or a real Spectrum and check out the 22 tunes on offer. Styles vary, as do the methods used to generate multi-channel sounds. Like me, if you appreciate computer-generated music, this will give you your next fix. My favourite is currently number 6, but as I re-listen, other tracks begin to grow on me. Remember, this is all a 48k machine, with just a tiny beeper. Enjoy! That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.